In this video, I'm going to answer archived viewers' questions about MS and pain. If you'd like to better understand ouchie in MS, then don't turn away, because that learning starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. If you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, please subscribe to the channel and make sure to ring the notifications bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming content. It's no secret that I love doing live stream Q&A Ask Me Anythings, where you guys fire questions about MS and I answer them on the fly. Unfortunately, I can't answer every question live. Today, I'm answering viewers' archived questions about multiple sclerosis and pain. When I went to med school, they taught me that MS didn't cause pain, and they were dead wrong. MS hurts. Let's discuss. Christopher Lambton asks, have you heard of any MS symptoms that feel like an electric feeling in your arms and back? The answer is yes, I have. In fact, there's a classic MS symptom called Lermite's phenomenon. Lermite is a dead white European that named this phenomenon after himself, where someone with MS bends their neck and they feel an electrical zap down their back into their feet. Why? Presumably because there's a lesion in the back of the spinal cord, and when you flex your neck, you're putting tension on it, and it's sending what we call an aphaptic discharge, and it feels like you're electrocuted. I have an entire video dedicated to Lermite's phenomenon, so I'll throw a card up above and make sure that I include a link in the description in case you want to check that out. Chris, this is a treatable type of pain, and it turns out that medicines that were invented to treat seizures work to treat these electrical aphaptic discharge type pains quite well. Please don't bear this. Talk to your MS provider and get some help. They can either dampen it or hopefully make it go away. Eric Garland asks, any tips other than the obvious that would help prevent or stop migraines? Currently taking Capaxone and that's it. Well, Eric, thanks for writing in. Turns out that migraines are very common. And in fact, people with MS are more likely to suffer from headaches and migraines than the general population. Now, when you said other than the obvious, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but I'm going to share with you what I refer to as headache hygiene, or behaviors that really help diminish headaches. Some of them may sound easy breezy, but they're behaviors that have been shown time and time again to decrease the frequency of headaches and to make them less severe. So what are they? Number one, getting adequate sleep. People may find that if they're skimping on their sleep and they're not getting adequate sleep, that their headache frequency is much higher. So make sure you're getting a proper eight hours of sleep each night. Number two, make sure that you eat three regular meals a day. If you're eating a little bit or going long periods without eating, your blood sugar levels and your insulin levels are going up and down and up and down, and that can certainly make managing headaches darn near impossible. The next thing is to stay adequately hydrated. Drink more water. I recommend drinking one glass of water with each of your three meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then drinking one glass of water between breakfast and lunch, and one glass of water between lunch and dinner. What else? Exercise. Exercise helps diminish headaches big time. I have friends that are headacheologists, and they won't even talk to you until you've begun an exercise regimen, because very frequently the headaches plummet in their frequency, and they're much more able to manage if you're on a regular exercise routine. We want to be cautious about overusing medicines, and there's an overuse phenomenon which can create a terrible cycle. Your head hurts, you pop some Tylenol, it takes the edge off, the Tylenol wears off, the headache comes back worse, you take more Tylenol. So if you're taking an abortive agent, uh, an abortive agent to break a headache, whether that be prescription or over-the-counter, make sure that you're not doing it more than three times a week. If you're doing it more than three times a week, there's other things that need to be done. What else can we do? Be cautious about caffeine. When we start off, I recommend that you don't change your caffeine levels. Don't go up and don't go down. A lot of headacheologists will actually take you off caffeine and let you withdraw. But for starters, I would just keep the level the same. My last pro tip is to keep a log in your calendar, write down the days that you have a headache, and write down uh, maybe a fact about it, like how severe it was or if there was an obvious trigger. The reason I suggest that is if you're having a headache every single day, and two weeks down the road, you have a headache only six days out of seven. That's improvement, but you might not know it unless you track it. So, Eric, I hope that these things help. 
I'll reference a video that I did on headaches up above and include a link down in the description below in case you want to hear more suggestions about how to manage head pain. Here's two related questions. The first one comes from Linda, who writes, What works for pain besides Percocet? I get Percocet, but sometimes it doesn't work. The second question comes from Ren, who writes, can we talk about nerve painkilling meds? I have talked in my channel before about how I strongly dislike the use of narcotics for trying to treat chronic neuropathic pain. Simply put, it doesn't really work. There's very diminishing returns. There's issues related to uh, dependence and tolerance. And it's a, a bad way of trying to manage long-term chronic neuropathic pain. I personally avoid narcotics in my practice altogether. I find that using neuropathic pain medicines are much more successful. And I'm talking about medicines that were originally invented either to treat seizures or originally invented to treat depression. And both of them have neurochemical properties that treat neuropathic pain. These medicines tend to not be addictive. They tend to not develop tolerance and dependence. And I have much greater success in using them. I would avoid the Percocets and the other narcotics and in fact, I'll include a link uh, about a video I did on this exact topic. Thanks for the questions. Question of the day. Which anti-seizure medicine has a dual indication, both for seizures and to treat pain? Is it number one, Cymbalta? Number two, Pamelor? Number three, Topamax? Or number four, Oxycodone? Stay tuned to the end of the video to find out the answer. Stacy asks, can MS cause arthritis flares very severely? Stacy, not exactly. Multiple sclerosis isn't directly associated with arthritis. However, there's a couple key points to keep in mind. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition. And if you have one autoimmune condition, you're more likely to have a second autoimmune condition. Rheumatoid arthritis is a type of autoimmune condition. And so I do have a handful of patients that have both MS and rheumatoid arthritis. Secondly, if MS impacts the way that you walk, so maybe you walk with a limp and you put more pressure on one leg, which stresses out one knee and one hip more than the other. That's a setup to have osteoarthritis or degenerative changes, which can be quite severe. So whereas MS doesn't directly worsen an arthritis flare, there's indirect reasons why they might be related. Thank you for the question. Olivia Nash asks, I was diagnosed with MS when I was 16. Do you have any tips for twitchy legs? currently struggling tonight with my legs. Well, Olivia, you're not alone. And very commonly, my patients describe that when they finally settle down at night, their legs give them fits and it keeps them from sleeping. And there's what we call in medicine a differential diagnosis or a list of what this could be. The two most common things that I see in my practice are spasticity and restless leg syndrome. And let me describe both because they're different. Spasticity is where the muscles don't coordinate themselves, and spasticity manifests as limbs that are hard to bend, spasms, which is like bouncing of the leg, or painful cramps. And sometimes the spasms are what people refer to when they say their legs are twitchy. Keep in mind that in the setting of spasticity, you have no control over it. Your leg just kind of does its own thing. The other option that I see frequently is restless leg syndrome. Now, restless leg syndrome is different. It typically happens when you're at rest. So when you're laying down to go to sleep at night is a prime time. And you develop an internal compulsion, a need to move your leg. It's not bouncing on its own, but you build up and you build up this strong need and you finally voluntarily shake your leg and it feels better for a split second and then it starts up again. And oftentimes with restless leg, people are getting out of bed and they're pacing around. These are different conditions and they're treated differently, but they both can result in twitchy legs. There are other things in MS that can cause twitchy legs, like different types of neuropathic pain and tremors from other areas. But the two most common ones I see are spasms from spasticity and restless leg syndrome. Both are treatable, and so make sure that you're talking to your MS provider so that you can get some relief. Nicole Jolly asks, does MS cause pinched nerves? And the quick answer, Nicole, is no. The nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. And multiple sclerosis impacts the central nervous system, brain, optic nerves, and spinal cord, so they're discrete. But as my mentor used to say, sometimes nature is a little too generous, and sometimes you can have both MS and a pinched nerve. The bottom line is, if you're having symptoms, bring them to the attention of your MS provider so they can help sort them out. 
through a careful history, through a careful neurological examination, and maybe MRIs or electrical tests, they can help you sort out, is this pain from MS or is it from a pinched nerve? Justin writes, hi, Dr. B. My name is Justin. I have PPMS. Question. I'd like to know uh, what's your thoughts on a nerve blocker for chronic back pain. I take Lyrica, Baclofen, and Ultram occasionally, and I want to stop. Well, Justin, thanks for writing in. Uh, thanks for your participation on the channel, and I love your question. I adore alternative methods for treating pain outside of popping pills. I love medicine by Edison, and I love focal injections. And so these are excellent avenues to explore. Why do I like them? because they're focal and they tend not to overlap and cause systemic symptoms. So instead of taking a bunch of pills that can have systemic side effects, a spinal cord stimulator only works to zap the pain in your back. Or a focal injection can just uh, anesthetize the area of concern. These are uh, things that can be explored with special doctors called physical medicine doctors or physiatrists or special pain specialists, and I definitely think they're worth pursuing. Your goal of getting off some of your pills is an awesome one, and I wish you the best of luck. If you explore that stuff, please let us know what you find out. Write back, because we'd like to hear. And now to answer the question of the day. Which anti-seizure medicine has a dual indication for both seizures and pain? The answer is number three, Topamax. Topamax is FDA approved both to treat seizures and to treat pain. My name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. If you'd like to learn more about MS, consider checking out this playlist right there. YouTube Analytics thinks that you would adore this video right there. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Just click the circle with my face on it. Go ahead, click my face. Until my next video or my next live stream, take care.